And my equipment present is going to be biased, and to make sure the bias is clear, it's in the title. It will be from our point of view, from a private company point. And uh, of course, in 20 minutes, I can only brush the surface of the subject, a few first general issues. Um, I'm going to, after a quick introduction, uh, give example of application, say why can I have strong in space optics, who are the key players, at least in the private sectors, um, and then focus myself at the end on our activity that we need in space optics. Just to make sure we're talking about the same thing, um, when I talk about optics, some strict um, authors will limit themselves to say that optics is indivisible only, but most opticians will agree with me that uh, our playground goes from the ultraviolet to the microwave, the fine infrared, because uh, in that energy band, the techniques, the materials, the drivers are mostly the same, so uh, we're, at, we're at ease from the UV to the far infrared. And when I talk to about space, I will limit myself to just stuff in orbit and beyond. There's some cool stuff going sort of all we saw this morning, but uh, at some time I, I need to limit the scope uh, somewhere. So space optics is one of our country uh, field of expertise in, in space. We have a very long expertise in space optics, longer than probably just anything else. Uh, but it tends to be a bit under the radar. Um, oh, I, I understand that some people will know why. <laughs> uh, a while ago, before the launch of RadarSat 2, I was talking to remote sensing colleagues and they were uh, broadcasting the impression that, well, in Canada, we're strong in radar. That's our main field of expertise. We're, we're uh, seen by other countries as being, as being strong in radar, and they gave the impression there was nothing wrong. But uh, when we look at the past, uh, it's easy to see that we have a uh, our heritage in space optics starts to the first very few years of Canada in space. In fact, the third satellite launched by our country was a space optics. And uh, I counted over almost uh, more than 18 government-founded space optics mission and space instruments. Um, if you count the radar, you won't get that much money. Um, why optics? Why space optics? When, well, optics is the science that harness photons to collect information and gather information about the world using photons. And when we look at sources, uh, through the light dim and through the radiation dim, if we know, we, we learn some information about the sources. And when light and photons interact with matters, uh, some wavelength will be absorbed, a uh, specific wavelength depending on the matter, so we get information about the chemical composition of that matter, its states, liquid, solid, gases, we get information about its temperature, so there's a rich amount of information conveyed by those photons. And that's basically what space object is, is transforming that light into uh, useful information. From Earth, from other planets, from our sun, from stars, from the background itself. The number of applications of space optics are too many to count. I, I, I filled that slide with different applications without even having had to scratch my head. I'm sure uh, you us together could triple, quadruple that list. So I'm, I won't even try to list them all. I will just go through a few examples. This is a map of our country at a resolution of 250 meters per pixel. It was collected using uh, visible and near infrared information from a satellite called MODIS. Uh, and uh, basically, it's a, it's a thematic map where each color is a different type of ground. Try to do that with an airplane. Uh, I, I wish you luck. It will take probably too long, but by the time you end up building up your map, it will be absolutely Because our country is big, we need space optics to survey our land, to watch what's going on, 
uh, overarching one. Another application is uh, uh, identifying finding forest fires. It's something we've been doing for a long time. So by carefully combining some uh, infrared and visible information, uh, it's fairly easy to detect forest fires from space. Um, another example. Yeah. Um, mapping air pollution. There's a Canadian instrument called MOPIT flying in space now, and its mission is to uh, measure uh, carbon monoxide. It's not something you can see with your eye. You cannot smell it. You cannot really feel it. Well, if the room was full of carbon monoxide, you probably won't feel much at all, or not for long, and not ever around. But from space, uh, they have been able to build that uh, that map that shows the distribution of CO across time to study the, uh, the diurnal cycle, the seasonal cycle of CO, see where it comes from, where it goes. Something that we do with space objects from space. Um, it's not only science that you can do uh, with space objects. That's uh, a picture of a ship, and that picture was captured by, by a high resolution imager. And it helped to show, uh, to put into evidence uh, slave labor in fishing uh, in some fishing areas. Basically, the large ship in the middle is collecting the catch from the two small ships, and those two small ships are using slaves as their crew. They never touch ground, they stay offshore all the time. The big ship will go off, uh, floating the catch uh, to a port with a, uh, a legal crew. And ob non obvious to nobody else, the, um, they, they were using slave labors. And recently, the, that scheme has been put into in evidence using satellite imagery. The next two slides are a list of, uh, of space missions founded by the Canadian government or space, in space objects instruments founded by the Canadian government. In red, these are the contribution. The contribution in black is uh, something for it. I've used a convention of mission slash instrument names, and uh, I've been able to fill two slides of that. Of course, I won't list all of them, but some are important. The first one, 1971, ISIS, the third satellite launched by our country. It had two optical instruments on it to study the aurora. And overall imaging is something that we've, uh, we are good at. And that heritage, uh, we attracted the attention of foreign countries. And overall imagers have been flying on uh, foreign missions, such as Viking and Frigia and others. Uh, Interval 2, a Russian mission, because of that first mission, because of ISIS. We have flown spectrometers. Um, yeah. uh, and spectrometer, uh, spectrometers at one was measuring the wind. We have other spectrometers here and uh, the other on the other page. We have some great uh, astrophysical uh, system as well. Most is one. On the next page, there's Bright. Uh, we have a system to look at uh, what's going on in orbit around us, space surveillance systems. Sapphire is one, Neosat is another one. We had, um, and the latest in them, I was hesitant to put it there because it hasn't been launched yet, but basically it's built up, delivered, final stage of testing. <coughs> Is the instrument is our pair of instruments that will go on the James Webb Space Telescope. So from 2000, it's from 2018, 17 to 1971, you, you can count over 18 uh, space object missions that Canada was uh, contributing large system. And I'm not counting the subsystems and the parts and the silence. Uh, that would uh, be way more. There are many private companies active in space optics. 
Honeywell, under different names through its uh, history, has contributed to many of them. Uh, NPB in Montreal has built an uh, optical instrument for a commercial mission called GGSAT. Uh, NEPTEC has a vision system, navigation systems that flew on the space shuttle, on the spacecraft that do the transit between Earth and the space station. Uh, Teledyne, through its uh, Bromo branch and uh, Dalsa branch and Optic, has contributed to cameras and lighters. Uh, I know in Quebec City has uh, delivered a system to an Argentine mission. MBA, although they won't consider themselves an optic, uh, a space optics company, they can track their routes back to the first ISIS, uh, uh, to the second ISIS satellite. And the budget that you have in your bag will tell you that direct story. Um, and ABB, well, we uh, we were in some of those missions. And, uh, I would probably say, in terms of large number of employees directly involved in space optics, we're probably one of the largest in the country. And I'm not counting the universities, the research centers, and all the optical, mechanical, electrical suppliers, uh, component suppliers that we have in the country. So I don't know how many people space optics uh, uh, employs in our country, but it's probably in the town. For us, ABB, uh, we are a big international company. Uh, nearly 200,000 people in 100 countries. But none of them, almost none of them, are doing uh, optics or even less are doing uh, space business. The only units of ABB doing uh, space stuff is uh, the units that is located in Quebec City, where I come from. We are about 240 employees. Uh, in that side here, and uh, we do R&D in optics. We are one of ABB's center of excellence and R&D centers in optics. We do external uh, projects for other people, and we do also we have a commercial production of uh, uh, ground instruments. But uh, we do space optics as well. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Why is it important for us? Um, I said we are about 240 employees down in Quebec City. Out of that 240, our R&D department is about 100 persons strong. It's a fairly unusual fraction. Usually, a typical commercial company of 200 <coughs> people would have maybe five people in R&D. We maintain that strong contingency, a contingent of people in R&D because we uh, sell our service to other people, to other companies, to other government, to Canadian Space Agency, to the Canadian Defense, and it helps us to um, keep a good balance between internal and external R&D. And most of our external R&D stuff is related to space. And out of uh, those uh, people, we employ scientists, chemists, physicists, engineers in mechanical, electrical, software, and uh, optical engineering. We have people with, uh, we, are, we have technicians, we have bachelors, masters, PhDs, and also we have some support personnel doing the most boring stuff. <laughs> one, one important thing also for us that we are able to spin up space and external R&Ds to, uh, to uh, develop new products, commercial products. And also, we also use sometimes our commercial products to spin up external R&D products and, and uh, space systems. So the balance is not only in the people, it's also in the expertise and the work we do. It, it goes across both ways, commercial to space, space to commercial. Of um, well, animation. Hmm. It just uh, this is just a small roadmap to show um, some of our past projects. It started with uh, in the early '90s with a commercial system we sold to 3M. They sent that system on the space shuttle for a flight, and uh, after that we started to work on bio cells in space. 
And uh, we have presented this system flying on five satellites. Um, as I mentioned, including some Canadian satellites. <coughs> we have, um, we, we provided stuff for uh, the Canadian Moppet instrument flying on uh, the US Terra satellite. We were the plant contractor for the uh, SISAT uh, instrument, the base FTS on board SISAT. We have delivered instruments to the United States, to Japan, who are building stuff for Europe. And within our backlog, we have um, about 12 uh, systems that we are working on for future space missions. We are strong mostly in the infrared, but we're expanding into the visible. We have delivered radiometric reference for the infrared system, uh, infrared spectrometers, uh, and temperometer for spectrometers. And, and I'm going to finish with three examples. First, SISAP, a fully Canadian mission with uh, Canadian instruments, two instruments on board. A visible infrared spectrometer and an infrared spectrometer. The goal of that mission was to measure, to capture measurements, to study the biochemistry, the, uh, the photophysics of ozone, how ozone is created and destroyed in the upper atmosphere. But since then, the mission has expanded to be a true trace gas monitoring mission. They, they measure, uh, I don't know, close to uh, 100 molecules and isotope products of those molecules in the atmosphere. Some of them have never been measured uh, from space before. The satellite was launched in 2003, and uh, the customer was, of course, the Canadian Space Agency. It was launched from the Pegasus. It's a uh, cool system that uh, is not launched from the ground. It's attached to the belly of an airplane. The airplane uh, take off and at uh, we launched the uh, the spacecraft like the the rocket like uh, like a missile, basically to reach orbit. Um, well, the project for us and our subcontractors and colleagues is about a total of one hundred fifty thousand hours of engineering. It takes a long time from the beginning of a project to the final launch. And the amount of paper you produce in such a project is, uh, is tremendous. If at the end of the, uh, the project, your pile of paper is not just as high as the rocket, it's because you were lazy. <laughs> <laughs> and that project, we use that to sell our expertise abroad. And because of that Canadian project, we win other contracts in the country, in Asia, and uh, as well. Another, our biggest project, however, is not a Canadian project, it's a US mission. We are providing the interferometer for the cross track infrared sounder, one of the newest instruments on board the low, the low Earth orbit uh, weather satellite of the United States. Uh, they plan to have five, six space units. We have uh, delivered three so far. They, uh, we are building it to the next two. One of them has been launched in 2011. The next one will be launched next year. And for us, it's been a contract that, in total, has brought more than $100 million of revenue. And it started just with a study on paper. Uh, some of that study was supported by a project of the Canadian Space Agency. And with the, the few dollars they gave us, we made uh, a bunch of money. <laughs> That's why domestic products are important. We use them as stepping stone to go uh, beyond those projects. GoSat is another thing that is outside the country. It's a Japanese mission. They called us because of our expertise, expertise developed through our commercial products, through our Canadian uh, project as well in space. Uh, we delivered the interferometer for GoSat 1, launched in 2009. We just delivered the second unit for a new mission called GoSat 2. When you were talking about the goal section. And we are providing all the infrared calibration black bodies for all the new weather satellites of UMETSAT in Europe, both in uh, the, uh, low, on low Earth orbit and also in uh, geostationary orbit. They have uh, four instruments 
four flagship uh, and, uh, on three different satellites, MTG uh, Sounder, MTG Imager, and Meta. They have four infrared instruments on those uh, satellites, and we are providing the onboard calibration system for all of them. That should keep us busy for a few minutes. So uh, I'm concluding by saying that space optics is really a significant part of the space business in, in our country. It involves a significant fraction of the space industry and the academia and research centers and RT, PRDC, uh, SFL, many, many industries as well. It's a significant source of export for those companies. And as I said, and I keep on repeating, all those significant products are important because you cannot succeed uh, in export if you're not successful within your country. Nobody will take you for service if you cannot manage, if you cannot manage, uh, sell your stuff domestically. Uh, and space optics in general, not just the Canadian space optics, but the myriad of optical stock in space is providing very valuable services to Canadians and to the world population in general. And also, I must say it's a lot of fun. In 19 years, 19 years working in that field, il n'y a pas un seul moment où je me suis levé à reculons pour aller travailler. Il n'y a pas un seul moment où je me suis levé. Non, pas ce moment. C'est lui. And uh, not a single day is the same as the day before and the day that will come after. Thank you.